In this lecture, we will cover the most commonly seen medical devices and the chest X-ray occurrence. We're going to start with cardiac devices. Atrial septal defects are among the most common congenital heart defects. Left to right shunting can lead to right heart enlargement and dysfunction, with some patients eventually developing pulmonary hypertension. Closure of the atrial septal defect is done surgically, or it can be done also percutaneously with this device that you see on the images. This is an ESD closure device, or also called an amplex device. This device is made of a nickel titanium alloy, also called a nitinol, which is mildly radiopaque, and it's, uh, it can be very difficult to see. But if you look at the lateral view, you can clearly make out the outline of the amplex device. The next cardiac device I would like to show you is the implantable loop recorder. These are small insertable devices that continuously monitor and record cardiac rhythms. Here you can see it on the AP view, and on the lateral view you can see it subcutaneously. So they are placed subcutaneously and used for the evaluation of patients with recurrent unexplained episodes of palpitations and syncope. Most of these um, models of uh, implantable devices that we can see nowadays are MRI compatible. However, some brands have received MR conditional labeling, so you may have to check for that. The most typical cardiac pacemakers you will see can be single chamber, dual chamber, or biventricular pacemakers. This first image shows you a biventricular pacemaker, which has a right atrial appendage lead, a right ventricular lead, just like a dual chamber, and there is a third lead uh, run along the coronary sinus towards the cardiac apex. On some patients, you may see wires overlying the cardiac contour with no battery pack attached to it. Those are typically epicardial biventricular pacers, which are used during cardiac surgery. The second image shows you a leadless cardiac pacemaker, which is implanted into the right ventricle. So as the name says, it has no leads, and this should not be mistaken for a loop recorder. Vagal nerve stimulators can be also mistaken for a pacemaker because it has a similar looking battery pack. However, these wires are heading cephala towards the neck. And uh, these are used for intractable epilepsy, treatment of uh, resistant depression or heart failure. This next image shows you a patient status post median stenotomy with an atrial clip in place. So this is a left atrial appendage epicardial clip over here. This is a type of atrial appendage closure device used to treat atrial fibrillation and it is applied epicardially with no foreign body contact with the bloodstream. These images show you the left atrial appendage closure device or called the Watchman device, which is also an implantable uh, device to close up the left atrial appendage for stroke prevention in patients who have atrial fibrillation and who have contraindications to pharmacological anticoagulation. This patient underwent median stenotomy and replacement of all four cardiac valves. I believe that um, it can be very difficult to tell these valves apart on a chest radiograph. It is much easier if the valves have a prong, as you can see in the next images. These are two different patients demonstrating the aortic and mitral valve replacement. So when the valves have these prongs, it's much easier to tell what kind of valve it is. A mitral valve uh, is pointing down towards Miami, while the prongs of an aortic valve are pointing up towards Alaska. So this is an aortic valve replacement and this one is a mitral valve replacement. Next, we're gonna go over the most commonly used vascular devices. This image demonstrates a tunneled diastasis catheter. So this is tunneled under the skin towards the internal jugular vein. Then it heads caudad towards the cable-atrial junction. So most of these central venous catheters need to terminate at the cable atrial junction. Uh, sometimes you're going to see a little lump 
where the SVC ends and the right atrium starts. Obviously, that will be the cavoidal junction. If you cannot see such thing, you can find the carina and then count two vertebral bodies below that uh, to get approximate to the level of the cavoidal junction. But practically anywhere within the SVC, this would be appropriate. Sometimes you see them extending into the right atrium. That's not ideal because it can cause arrhythmias. This chest x-ray demonstrates a broken PIC line. Uh, PIC is a periphery inserted central catheter that usually comes in from one of the upper extremities. So this one is heading up through the x-ray vein. And then you can see that there is a huge break through the catheter. Uh, it should extend through the subclavian, preciocephalic, and then down uh, towards the superior vena cava and terminate here at the cava atrial junction. Uh, notably, this patient also underwent transverse stenotomy in the past. This image depicts a Swangens catheter, which are rarely used nowadays, uh, but technically these are central venous catheters that uh, head through the right atrium, right ventricle, out through the pulmonary outflow, and then uh, should be parked somewhere in the main pulmonary arteries. This is a little bit far out. You do not want the catheter tip to be uh, beyond uh, the border of the hilum. Uh, these are um, these were historically used to measure the right heart hemodynamic indices, pulmonary arterial and capillary wedge pressures. The image also shows you a vascular catheter coming in from the left IJ, terminates in the proximal SVC. And then uh, I'm assuming that this is an enteric tube, uh, which is in the mid esophagus that's inappropriately high. And there is also an ET tube above the carina. As I said earlier, all these central venous catheters need to terminate uh, somewhere at the cavoidal junction. This image shows you a port catheter, and the port terminates in the distal SVC. Uh, the other image shows you an IG line which was misplaced. This is not heading cephalate towards the cavoidal junction, but got into the superior, um, sorry, the subclavian vein and out into the axillary vein. In the next few images, we're going to look at uh, placement of uh, esophageal devices. So this first image shows you a nasogastric tube in satisfactory position within the stomach. The nasogastric tubes typically have a side hole uh, where there is a break on the radiopic markers. So you can clearly see where it is. That side hole needs to be below the diaphragm as well. So ideally, you want the tip to be at least 10 centimeters below the diaphragm. On this first image, you see a misplaced enteric tube. This is actually a feeding tube. You can tell that it's a feeding tube and not a suction tube because the tip is markedly radiopic. So that's a weighted tip feeding tube. And uh, this tube actually headed down through the right main bronchus into the right lower lobe. If you look at the appropriately placed tube, you can see that it's going down the midline and it never follows the course of any of the bronchi. You may also see esophageal stents. Uh, this one is in the distal esophagus, heading across the gastroesophageal junction. And these are typically placed on um, esophageal cancer patients to uh, give them symptomatic relief from esophageal strictures and uh, dysphagia. Esophageal manometry is part of the workup for gastroesophageal reflux disease, dysphagia, achalasia, and other systemic diseases associated with esophageal problems such as scleroderma. Its role is to demonstrate esophageal abnormal motor function. Some of these uh, manometers are very difficult to see and they almost look like a, a swallowed earring. These two images show you the pleural pigtail drain and the surgical chest tubes. Pleural pigtail drains are typically placed by interventional radiology or the pulmonary team places them as well for pneumothorax or for simple pleural effusion, which can be drained through a small bore catheter. These have multiple side holes and you can often see the side holes on chest X-ray or on chest CT. You want all these side holes to be within the thoracic cavity. This image shows you an appropriately placed chest tube. So the surgical chest tubes also have 
a break on the radio peak marker where the last side hole is at. This needs to be within uh, the thoracic cavity. If you look at the other chest tube, it has two breaks on the radio peak marker and the second one is outside of the thoracic cavity. So this is too far out. Uh, this needs to be repositioned. I saved the best for last. The most important uh, tube in a chest x-ray is the endotracheal tube. So on the first image, you can see an appropriately placed ET tube. Uh, ET tube should be about five centimeters above the carina plus minus two centimeters. So do find the carina and then you can measure from there. Uh, on the second image, you can see the endotracheal tube uh, was placed into the right main bronchus, which resulted in complete collapse of the left lung. Endobronchial valves could be very difficult to pick up on a chest x-ray. So look at the second image, uh, the magnified image of the right hilum. So these are endobranchial valves which restrict airflow to a particular lung segment. These devices are typically inserted via bronchoscopy and uh, they are there to permit drainage of the airway secretions adverse during expiration. However, they restrict the incoming airflow during inspiration. They were originally designed as an alternative to surgery for lung volume reduction in cases of uh, severe emphysema. And uh, they have also been used to treat bronchopleural and bronchoalveolar fistulas with persistent air leaks.